Welcome to the Baltic University and session number 10 of our course the Baltic Sea Environment. Yes, you are quite right. I am on my way to saw off the branch I am sitting on. But it's not only me, all of us in industrial society through its use of non-renewable resources, huge amounts of energy and the resulting environmental destruction is so to speak sawing off the branch we are sitting on. Today in the last session of the Baltic University we are going to analyze why this is so and what changes are necessary to create a society that is in harmony with nature, that in principle could last forever or in short a sustainable society. But before doing that we are going to analyze in some more detail our situation today. This is Lulio at the northern tip of the Bothnian Bay. Behind me we see uh, the magnificent panorama with the Bothnian Bay in the far end and we see the Lule Elbe, the big river coming in from the Swedish mountains. Um, we have the modern society in one um, glimpse of the eye. What characterizes modern society, Nils? It's an interconnected system and it is largely driven by fossil fuels. What are the components of this system? One important component here is the industry, of course. And we see here a Swedish steel company producing steel from iron and from iron ore and coal. And the iron is coming in by railway. It comes from the uh, lapish mines uh, by rail. The coal comes from abroad by boats. And a lot of coal is used. Yes, coal and iron ore is still the basis for industrialized societies. Mm. And then we have the urban settlement, of course. Yes, in this system is also the city, of course, with mm -hmm. the people working in the industry. And a lot of energy use. I know that the Lule Elv is an important contributor to the energy up here. Yes, uh, it is uh, the, the river providing most electricity of all the Swedish rivers. Mm -hmm. So this is about 30% of the hydroelectric power in Sweden, I think. Somewhere near that, yes. Mm -hmm. And then we have the ecosystems, the forests and the fields. Yes, and we need to keep them healthy and productive because they are the basis for a sustainable society. What you just saw was filmed two weeks ago in Luleå, then still with ice on the river. Today we broadcast from nice and warm Vårdsätra outside Uppsala, a favorite spot for the students of Uppsala University. The water, Lake Ekholm, is a bay of Mälaren which empties into the Baltic Sea. We have gathered our panel here. Nils Tiberg is Professor of Waste Management and Recycling at Luleå University of Technology. You just saw his normal surroundings. Nils is the coordinator of the session. Tage Sundström also comes from the northern end of the Baltic region. Tage is an associate professor of physics and works with the human ecology at Umeå University. Arthur Granstedt is from the nearby Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Arthur is state extension specialist and has research in nutrient flows and future agriculture. We are happy to also welcome two guests from the eastern rims of the Baltic region. Linas Klutininkas from Kaunas is a physicist at the Center for Environmental Studies at the Vitautas Magnus University. And Nikolai Filatov is an oceanologist and director of the Institute of Water Problems of the Academy of Sciences at Petrozavodsk in Russian Karelia. You are all welcome. The two hours we have in front of us will start with the presentation of the background of industrial society, its history, energy use and flow of matter. Then we will talk a lot about waste and what to do with it, and the pipe solutions, recycling or trying not to produce it at all by cleaner technology. There will then be some music of course, and then sustainability will be the subject and how it can be applied in industry, in agriculture and in our own lives. We will end with a big debate and then the grand finale of the Baltic University. So first to the historical background. We start from the very beginning when the ice melted and also from the other end of Sweden. So we go from Luleå in the north to the southern tip of Sweden. Here at Stenshuvud in the province of Skania, in the most southern part of Sweden, I have this magnificent view of the Baltic. It is easy to imagine that people coming here some 13,000 years ago 
of the withdrawal of the ice met with a view of the sea not very different from that we see today. In the middle of the Neolithic period, groups of long houses with thatched roofs appeared, but people still moved their pasture land throughout the area and thus were not stationary. Grazing gradually opened the countryside and the area of deciduous forest decreased. The hoe was replaced by the wooden plough and the area of pastured land increased heavily during the Bronze Age. Animals were kept indoors during the winter and manure was stored to be used in the fields to increase the yield. In the late Iron Age, proper villages were formed and some of them can still be seen today. In 1820, land use at Stenshuvud was at its maximum. Fields, grazing land and meadows left very little area for forest. In 1920, rational farming began. Grazing decreased and small fields were abandoned. This favored woodland succession within former outland areas. Hornbeam started to expand and forests began to cover land in hilly regions like Stenshuvud. If the long-term history deals with resources from the living nature, crop and animal, the history of the last couple of hundred years deals with how industry developed. The steam engine was developed by James Watt back in the 1770s. This machine made it possible to extract work between a hot boiler and a cooler, and the boiler could be fired with coal. In this way, the energy in fossil fuels could be exploited, and they were in good supply. Now industry could expand without being restricted to the renewable energy from forests and waterfalls. Completely new technologies were based on advances in physics, chemistry and biology. The important phenomenon of electromagnetism was discovered in the beginning of the 1800s. This new knowledge made the electric motor possible and the reverse of it, the electric generator. This new form of energy, electricity, was a basis also for the development of chemical industries, telecommunication and so on. At the same time the combustion engine gave rise to petroleum and automobile industries and to the construction of roads and a new infrastructure. Workers for the industries were recruited from growing populations. People migrated from the countryside into swelling urban areas. Simultaneously, the agriculture was developed to increase food production. Mechanization, artificial fertilizers, biocides and imported fodder now enable a few percent of the population to feed the rest. When we arrive to our more recent history, perhaps the increase of energy use is the most clear example on how society has developed the last few decades. During the development of industry, more and more energy has been supplied to society. Wood and charcoal were once the most important energy sources in Sweden. When they were short in supply, first coal and then later oil was brought in to fill the demands from the transport sector, from industries and for heating of buildings. In order to extract hydroelectricity, large dams were built and huge generators were installed. When all available hydroelectricity was used, then the nuclear energy was finally introduced. During the after-war period, from 1950 to 1970, the energy consumption increased several fold up to a new level. The energy was originally provided by renewable or flowing resources, such as burning of wood, power from waterfalls, or from the wind for windmills and sailing vessels. But as the industrial society develops, the energy comes 
to an increasing extent from the non-renewable stocks of coal, oil, gas and uranium. Tage, you are a human ecologist and I'm sure you can describe this de increase of energy use in a, in a way that relates to ourselves. Well, if you would like to know whether this is uh, much or little, mm. I think a, a reasonable comparison is to make with uh, what we consume as an organism. Mm. And it turns out that these days, counting everything in Sweden at least, we would uh, uh, have 70 or 80 energy slaves mm. uh, at our disposal. I think it's a, one kind of measure of uh, mm. where we are on the scale in energy mm. utilization. And in the very primitive society that was showed as the first in this uh, um, historical expose, what would the consumption be then in terms of the human units? Well, I think some investigations show that it isn't too little anyway. I mean, mm. even uh, the crops uh, and the waste uh, and um, counted and uh, the firewood uh, would mount up to some eight or ten even. Mm. Mm. But uh, I don't know how well it is uh, investigated. And then the 1950s, right before this enormous increase. Mm. Yes. Uh, I think we have had a fourfold increase after mm. 1950. Mm. On our electric grid, it's mm. eightfold, very nearly. Mm -hmm. Now, Niels, what characterizes this large increase from the 50s and on? Yeah, we are getting more and more dependent on the non-renewable resources, mm. and especially on oil, of course. Mm. We have a short uh, picture of that that, can de that describes the situation. Yes, uh, as you can see here, uh, the oil with present, present production or pumping will last for the world about 40 years. Western Europe, the pumping in the North, field, uh, North Sea would be about 12 years and in the former USSR it's about 30. But if Europe was to be provided uh, from its own oil sources, it would last only 3 years and 18 years in the case of USSR. If we turn to another uh, kind of energy to the natural gas, mm -hmm. the, the depletion time is much longer mm -hmm. and for coal it's even longer, it's a couple of mm -hmm. 200 years. So in one generation the oil is ended, you mean? Yes, it mm -hmm. looks so, at mm -hmm. present consumption. But what about the situation in, for example, uh, Russia and Lithuania? Uh, Linas, what would you say is the situation? <coughs> yes, such small country like Lithuania, he it is seven times smaller than Sweden, with the inhabitants 2.5 times less than Sweden, mm. is a producer, exporter of energy. Mm. Uh, though we have no fossil fuels, mm -hmm. but we export the, the fossil fuels from, from the ex-USSR. So the problem is how efficiently to use our our fossil fuel we we import from the USSR. So the solution was found. We have we, now we started to build new energy accumulation plant mm -hmm. in the central part of Lithuania. What what is the situation in Russia then, uh, Nikolai? Mm -hmm. uh, the energy for use, is it increasing or decreasing? Yes, for several decades uh, we increase uh, using of energy. And uh, we have a lot of very big, huge enterprises. Mm -hmm. They demand lots of energy for unit of production. I see. And where do you get it from? Pardon? Where do you, do you get it from, the energy? Fossil oh, fuels? Fossil fuels, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All kinds. So we use a lot of energy in our uh, modern society. Now we're going to discuss another aspect that's connected to energy very much and that is the flow of materials in modern society and we will start by looking at the uh, flow of carbon which is intimately connected with energy. Plants absorb carbon dioxide together with water and form carbohydrates. At the same time oxygen is given off. The carbon dioxide is again released when the plants molder. 
The same happens if they are digested by animals or if they are burnt. A cyclic flow is formed. Some plants and microorganisms have accumulated underwater where oxygen-free conditions are created. This is how coal and oil has formed during millions of years. With the industrial development, the fossil fuels are used in comparatively short time. For the oil, the proven reserves will last about 40 years with present consumption. This consumption releases some 25 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere of the Earth each year. The content of carbon dioxide of the atmosphere has increased in an exponential way as you can see in this diagram. Now we can see how is the carbon flows in uh, our societies, what is the relationship between uh, the, uh, those being uh, produced biologically and those being produced from fossil fuels, Niels? Yes, I have some data on that. Mm -hmm. I have a picture and uh, hopefully we'll get the picture mm -hmm. so we can uh, discuss it. But anyhow, uh, there is much more carbon coming yes. from fossil fuels today. Yes. That is, For instance, mm -hmm. in, in the case of uh, Poland, no, you, see it. Uh, mm -hmm. you see here, in Poland, uh, the fossil fuel usage is 38 gigawatt hours per year, compared to seven uh, harvest from the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Denmark, it's three times as much from the fossil fuels mm -hmm. and from the ecosystems. And Finland yeah. and Sweden of course, of course have a lot more of, of uh, yes. natural resources. Yes, that's mm -hmm. uh, hydropower and uh, nuclear power, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, quite substantial in those mm -hmm. two countries. Mm -hmm. So the uh, fossil uh, sources are much more important in eastern countries, it looks like at the present. Uh, we can look at any uh, flow of material indeed in society and we will now see what uh, we can learn from the flow of metals and that is your specialty Niels, the flow of metals. Oh yes, mm -hmm. I've been working on that for some time mm -hmm. and we'll uh, regard here the flow of one metal uh, which has been used for at least since the Roman times and that is lead mm -hmm. and uh, we'll see uh, how the use of lead is in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And the situation which we'll look at is the situation in 1989. Here in 1989, comes. a total of 35,000 tons of lead was used in various products. 20,000 tons of this came from recycling of lead in car batteries. Lead from mining contributed 15,000 tons. The registered emissions to air and water from industry and traffic had been reduced by means of filter technology and the diminished lead content in petrol, but it still amounted to 500 tons. Much more than that, or about 3,000 tons, was estimated to arrive in landfills. But what happened to the rest? The residual 11,500 tons was apparently spread throughout Sweden in different products. You know, when we have looked at these things earlier, we have uh, talked about budgets, what's coming in and what's coming out. Now you show it as a trumpet. Yeah, that That's is a trick of yours. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a pedagogic trick to mm -hmm. show that the material, the lead in this case, is uh, more or less blown out into society. And what's happening with it in society? Uh, I'll show you that in the next video. Hello, stop! Do you know how much lead is spread every year with ammunition? No, I don't know. It's about uh, 1,000 tons of lead into the forests. If you open up, we'll have a look. So every shot here is about 30 grams of lead, lead shot in it. And from this type of ammunition, I think it's about 250 tons of lead spread into the forests every year in Sweden. Yeah, the lead shots, they are very fine. 
And when they are spread out into nature, uh, they can be dissolved quite easily. In shallow waters, for instance, birds can mistake the lead shots for sand, and in this way they get uh, toxic amounts of lead in, in the blood. This petrol contains lead, and uh, about 85% of this lead will be spread directly with the exhaust, and some 15% will be found in the motor oil, which is another environmental problem, of course. Totally for Sweden, uh, the amount, the re registered amount of uh, lead in gasoline, in petrol, has been uh, a number of 100 tons per year, but is uh, decreasing now due to the introduction of unleaded petrol, which is very important for the future. The lead in these batteries will be sent to a remelter and it will be recycled. There's a lot of lead used in batteries for cars. For Sweden, it is about close to 20,000 tons every year. But some of it is not recycled efficiently and will arrive in landfills, be in the environment someplace. And the lead will then be spread sooner or later where we don't want it. We are surrounded by lead in our daily lives. You find it everywhere. For instance, here you see lead in cables. And uh, lead is also used in pigments. In this paint, for instance, it's containing lead oxide. You also find lead in, it's used in plastics, maybe also cadmium in this, and in rubber. And for instance, in the ordinary light bulb, you find metallic lead here in the solder in the bottom, and also up here. So the problem is that the level of lead is slowly increasing. All these products give off emissions. We can call them consumption emissions. And this makes uh, the level of lead s increasing slowly, and especially in the highly populated areas, in the cities, in the big cities, where we already have toxic effects from lead. And these effects are on the nervous system, and also on the brain. And especially children are susceptible to damage by exposition to lead. The flow of lead is quite large and we calculate that the accumulated amount of lead in Swedish society is something like two million tons over the last hundred years. And they give off a lot of emissions. But an even larger flow is that of nutrients and now we look at that. It's uh, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. The input of nutrients to society is mainly from the artificial fertilizers. Each year they are spread over arable land containing nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Nitrogen is also formed in combustion processes and is mainly spread from the traffic. The nutrients added to the food producing system we leak sooner or later from fields, animal manures, and also from the human waste arising in urban areas. The Baltic Sea is a recipient of these rather diffuse emissions of nutrients from the surrounding countries. The amount is much too high. Arthur, from your point of view as agricultural specialist, what are the sources of these nutrients? Uh, Today we have a situation with uh, three to four times more artificial fertilizers to the agriculture as you find in the uh, 
products of, from animals and vegetables products from the agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is from the reason that you have a transport of nutrients from the plant production to the concentrated animal production. On mm -hmm. that, from there it's going out in the environment. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with the organization of society as a whole. So mm -hmm. we must mm -hmm. have a situation with the uh, circulating of, of uh, nutrients mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. crop production and, and uh, mm -hmm. This production. brings us to the general question on how these flows arrive and how they, uh, how they are formed. Do you have a comment on this, Niels? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. of course, we have seen a number of open flows here mm -hmm. from the carbon to the sky and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, we might uh, see what's meant by an open flow. Mm -hmm. Starting in the resource, ending in the environment. That's right. More or less. Um, I think we have a picture showing that actually. There it is. Yes, here mm -hmm. you see uh, mm -hmm. the raw materials from nature passing through industry and to the consumer and ending up as waste mm -hmm. and pollution. So this is a sort of definition as waste also. It takes us to a rather much broader definition of waste than what is normally the case. And this is what we are talking, going to talk about now. Let's talk about waste. Yes. The centralized and urban structures requires large amounts of raw materials and energy coming from non-renewable sources such as fossil fuels, ores and minerals, but also from renewable resources produced in fields, forests and in the seas. The result of the use of energy and matter in society, in the societal metabolism, so to say, is waste. A substantial amount of gaseous waste is formed from transportation, from industries and from the heating of houses. A main component is carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. Solid waste comes from all parts of the system and especially from the extraction of raw materials and from manufacturing industry. Packaging is an integrated part of the system and has grown to an industry of its own. So waste is plentiful also from households. Water is used in large amounts and the amount of wastewater conducted and pumped through the sewers is very high, with some 50 tons per person and year, from the households alone. It's a little strange to talk about waste because we are sitting in this beautiful nature and we don't see any waste around us, but I'm sure there are, although it's more or less invisible. Uh, Nils, what would you say as a professor of waste management here are the most important kinds of waste we have? Yeah, we, we tend to forget uh, the, vi the invisible waste. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, carbon dioxide accounts for the largest weight per person of uh, all the different kinds of and that waste. That we have around us all the time, yes? Yes. How much do we produce? I think you have some figures. Yes, mm. uh, I have compiled some figures from uh, uh, available sti statistics mm -hmm. and uh, here we can see yearly figures for Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Poland and it varies from 8,000 in Sweden tons of carbon dioxide per year to 15,000 and here is the household waste which is from 320 to 400 kilos per year and per person so we have several tons per person and year. What, what about the situation in uh, Russia, um, Nikolai? Do you uh, have a comment on that? What kind of waste do you produce? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our uh, water purification systems in uh, enterprises uh, don't uh, utilize uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and rise problem uh, with uh, eutrophication. Mm -hmm. Other problem in the uh, atmosphere. We have a very strong uh, sulfur emission mm -hmm. and uh, into atmosphere and other problem acidification of uh, um, soils and uh, waters. Mm -hmm. So you would concentrate on gaseous and liquid waste. Dinas, what would you say for the case of Lithuania? Yes, I would mm -hmm. like to to example on Tetra Pak. 
Uh -huh. It's a great temptation for Eastern Europeans uh -huh. to start living on Western European standards, yes? Uh -huh. So not long ago we started to produce the Tetra Pak paper bags for milk uh -huh. before we had had uh, glass bottles. Uh -huh. I know that in Scandinavian countries there were many discussions and there are still now. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, Tetra Pak is a Swedish invention and it's one company that's running very, very well, also in these hard times of hard economy. So packages industry is, is uh, still going strong. But it might not go in the future, we will see. Now we will see what sort of countermeasures are possible to handle the waste situation. And the first one is, of course, the end of pipe technologies. Power plants, cement factories and metallurgical industries like this steel plant use a large amount of fossil fuels, mainly coal. Accordingly, they will also produce huge amounts of carbon dioxide containing flue gases. In the combustion processes, ashes are formed and in high temperature processes metals vaporize and in this way oxidic dust is formed. To keep the working conditions clean and also the surroundings, big fans and filters are installed. The dust is obtained in the bottom of the filters and has to be disposed of. And in some cases, it's possible to recycle the dust, as for instance, in this case, where the dust is briquetted. When these briquettes have hardened, they can be used as raw materials again. In other cases, the dust is too low in value, too contaminated, or it's too difficult to handle. And in this common case, the clean environment of today has been obtained at the cost of steadily growing waste heaps for our children to take care of. Ashes and dust piling up from the heavy industries contain metals. In contrast, the sludge from the water treatment plants, as we see here, mainly contain nutrients, but they also contain small amounts of metals and other potentially toxic compounds. The sludge from water treatment plants is often sent to a landfill. And the landfills grow in size every year and give off emissions to air and water. This barge is loaded with garbage from New York. It got public attention a year ago and it couldn't be unloaded. No wonder that people don't want landfills in their surroundings. So it, they are fighting about not having the waste on the backyard in New York, but there are people are fighting also here. What are they fighting about in Russia, for example, Nick? At the present time, our people only start a struggle against, for example, waste nuclear power stations. Yes, that is also quite common in yeah. Sweden, I tell you, to fight against that. We will see if waste, uh, piling up waste is a final solution. It's not very much because uh, there is a uh, transfer Always. We will look at that in the same next video. The material, the matter, does not stay in the landfills. Gas is formed in landfills. So in this landfill, we'll have landfill gas being produced, and that goes up into the atmosphere. But we also leach out, sooner or later, we leach out the nutrients and also metals. And they will be found here in the leachate, in the water that comes out of the landfill. And this water is uh, often sent to some treatment because it contains too much nutrients to be sent out and also metals and other toxic compounds. So we usually send them, in this case, the water is pumped some 10 kilometers to a wastewater plant in Luleå. And there chemicals are added and a sludge is formed. And this sludge is not very good to use in, for 
agricultural purposes. So it's brought back by lorry, it's put up here on this landfill. And in that way we are building up a circulation which is unsustainable of course in the long run. So, so much about piling up the waste, it's not a very easy approach. Another one is to reuse the waste and that is the approach of recycling. Under the pressure of solid waste overfilling landfills and at the same time strong opposition to incineration, recycling is an obvious countermeasure. In addition, recycling reduces the amount of natural resources required. Energy and the environment can be saved as well. In the 70s, a number of big plants for central separation of household waste were built. In spite of heavy investment, the results were disappointing. The paper and plastic fractions were mixed and dirty and not suitable for recycling. And the compost produced was too contaminated with heavy metals. Much more promising is recycling of source-separated fractions. In the homes, paper, metals, glass and also hazardous waste are handled separately. The sorted fractions must also be transported separately. In Sweden, about 60% of the paper from newspapers and journals is recycled. Glass preserves food and beverages well. The reuse of glass bottles is important from an environmental point of view and even better than recycling glass for remelting. When steel is made from iron scrap, the energy requirement and the environmental impact is much lower than when iron ore is used. Metal scrap recovery is most important in the commercial sector, in industry, agriculture and transport. Only a minor part of metal consumption is in the household. Legislation is now used to force producers and dealers to be responsible for the waste according to the polluter pays principle. In Germany, they will simply have to come together and develop some kind of recycling system because the consumers will have the right to leave the waste in the shops. A solution tried is manual sorting of the bad smelling waste using endless conveyor belts. Only low wage immigrant labor have accepted that work. Hopefully in the future there will be less packaging and less solid waste. Now the separation and local composting of organic waste from households is a growing movement over Europe, even in cities. Composting is not only an important recycling device, it is naturally combined with the use of compost in gardening and is often a part of a general change in values and lifestyle. So this was a very positive presentation of recycling, Nils. What are the problems? I'm sure there are some. Yes, there are limitations to recycling and uh, these are economical because uh, Recycling is labor-intensive and uh, with high wages it is a limitation. But they are also technical. Uh, so for instance, uh, in a recycling loop you can easily get contaminants. Scrap can be contaminated with copper and so on. And uh, paper fibers uh, can only be recycled some six or eight times before they are worn out. So in general, uh, recycling is good on the macro scale but not on the molecular level. You mm. cannot recycle carbon dioxide, for instance. No, no. We didn't actually see much of recycling, just waste separation. So let look, let's look at this um, few pictures of recycling of paper, where you can see how it's uh, collected here, and then what's happening to it. Yes. Here, center of factory, I guess. Here is uh, paper being sorted uh, into different uh, fractions, you get a better price if you can have a clean quality. The paper is uh, then brought into a, a machine which uh, dissolves it and here you see the ink, the carbon black, mm -hmm. being uh, flotated away. And that is later on burnt in, a, as you can see, goes to a, used for energy purpose. 
And uh, the paper, uh, the paper fibers, clean paper fibers, are then used to make new paper again. And so the cycle is closed. Mm -hmm. uh, so one possibility is recycling them, a limited possibility. But another one is, of course, not to produce any waste at all. And that is uh, the called the cleaner technology approach. And it's something that's gaining momentum in industry. And uh, we got a reportage from the Dutch Ministry of uh, Environment for this, which we will watch. So some people started to look at the cause of pollution. It is surely more intelligent to prevent waste in the first place. And prevention is no utopian idea. In Europe, there are companies where pollution prevention approaches have already been successfully utilized. Here at Chromalux, a galvanizing company in Rotterdam, they decided to do something about it. One of the obvious steps, solve the wastewater problem at the source. Instead of throwing it away and paying to have it cleaned, they installed a purifier. The result, internal reuse paid off, economically and environmentally. They concluded that pollution prevention equals improved efficiency. In nature, there is no waste. Everything is used and reused. <clears throat> a matter of being efficient. The same could be said about industry. Waste is a sign that somewhere in the process there is a weak spot. In other words, that there is a need for efficiency and innovation. That's what Landskrona Ambalage, a Swedish printing company, proved. Until recently, it was impossible to use water-based inks to print successfully on plastics. So everybody used organic solvent-based inks. But they had negative side effects on profits as well as the environment. With help from the government, branch representatives and specialists, this company changed its printing process. They succeeded in applying water-based inks. The result? A better printing quality and less waste. Again, it paid off. Pollution prevention is a different way of thinking. Start at the beginning of the production process. Think the other way round. First is the conviction that something has to be done about waste. The next step is an essential one, corporate commitment. The following steps are creating an assessment team, obtaining involvement, setting clear goals for waste prevention, and a proper timetable. Then do a waste reduction assessment. What goes in somewhere must come out. It's like solving a puzzle. Every step in production must be taken into account. Evaluate all options to prevent waste at the source. Internal reuse, good housekeeping, energy losses. Before implementing any option, think. Is it suitable? Technically, environmentally, legally, economically. And what will public acceptance be? In other words, will it pay off? Only then start implementing the chosen most urgent options with the involvement of all employees. Monitoring and evaluating is the obvious next step. When you have reached your goals, it is not the end of the story. Pollution prevention is not a destination. It's an ongoing journey. The further one looks, the more one finds. Which means the same process again, again and again. This is only part of the story. A lot of waste can obviously be reduced with existing technology. The first step into pollution prevention can and will be cost effective. However, not all environmental problems can be solved this way. In some cases, there is a need for research and development to create new business opportunities. Chromalux, another Prisma project company, went further. Together with their industrial branch organization, they improved their galvanizing process. The result, the use of toxic cyanide was no longer necessary. Furthermore, they now reclaim residual oils. The next goal is to extract zinc out of waste water sludge. Chromalux has proved that the sum of small changes can make a company work more efficient, profitable and cleaner. So I was wrong. This video comes from the uh Minister of Economic Affairs, which you saw from the business-like character of it. But still, there are limitations, aren't there, to clean the technology, Niels? 
Yes, uh, it, it is about the same as with recycling. Mm. Uh, it mainly addresses a problem of specific uh, substances, toxic substances. Mm. And uh, things like the carbon dioxide flow, the nutrient flow, are not really addressed by, by this approach the, at all. Mm. Not either. No. We do have four approaches now that we have seen, so we will see this in a little uh, conclusion here. And the first approach is the dilution one. Waste can be diluted, and this is the case with the lead in society, as you showed, and also with nutrients, of course. Um, the next one is the end of pipe solutions. They have the limitations, Niels. Yes, uh, as we have said, uh, we are still diluting through them. And then the recycling, also limited. And finally, the cleaner technology. So we are sitting here with a number of uh, solutions to them, but they have all their limitations. And what are the results in terms of environmental problems? Yes, during the same time as we have used these uh, approaches, the environmental problem have uh, gone from being local to uh, regional like the problems of the Baltic, the acidification, the dying forest. Mm -hmm. And we haven't solved these problems. And on top of that, we now have the global problems. So it seems that uh, there is something lacking. Mm -hmm. Our understanding is not quite good. And the global problems are, for example, the carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere. That yes. will not be addressed by any of these measures, as we said. No, that ne needs mm -hmm. another approach. Yes. Before we go on to that approach, we are going to listen to some music and this time we will have a band from uh, Uppsala, a student band who was actually part of a festival this last weekend together with an Estonian student band by the way but they are betting in Estonia but this one, Hornbuskapen, is still here. It's uh, one of the uh, most traditional bands in uh, Uppsala. They have existed for almost 150 years but the music they're playing I'm sure is going to be a little more modern than that. Thank you very much for this musical resource being created right in the midst of nature out here at Vortsetra. It's time to continue with a more thorough analysis of our situation and we'll do it by applying some little theory, thermodynamics, 
And the first law of thermodynamics says that nothing disappears. And uh, we will see how that can be illustrated by Niels again. The environmental situation of today can be symbolized by this experiment. A pail is a system. For instance, it is the municipality of Lulio with the nutrients coming in. After some time, we find that the system leaks. For instance, uh, this is a point source, the wastewater. So we build a wastewater plant here. And we try to stop, it was quite difficult. We try to stop the flow here. Yeah, we succeeded nearly. But what happens? The nutrients still come in and uh, accumulates in the system. So new leaks appear over here. Maybe that is uh, the landfill. So we'll try to stop that. And, uh, but there are new leaks because the system is filling up all the time. The more we seal the leaks here, the faster the system will fill up. And uh, sooner or later, the system will simply overflow. And in that situation, the inflow and the outflow are similar. So with all our efforts, we have gained nothing. Well, Nils, thank you for presenting the dilemma to us so clearly. What are your solutions? Well, of course, we have to establish cycles instead of these open flows. Mm. And how can that be done, I mean, in principle? Tage, do you have a comment as more theoretician? Well, I should like to apply some thermodynamics to the environmental dilemma. Mm. And you state very nicely the first law of thermodynamics, nothing disappears. Mm. Uh, it applies also to energy, as a matter mm. of fact, since mm. uh, energy cannot be destroyed. Um, uh, and uh, we've got the second law of thermodynamics as well. Mm. And it states that uh, everything is dispersed. Mm. And we see that very clearly now that uh, we've got uh, molecular waste, we've got atomic and even nuclear waste. Mm. We've got it in the air, in the waters and on the land. Uh, we can uh, certainly decrease uh, the pollution pressure overall by mm. using less energy, mm. by increasing the energy efficiency. And that is something that everyone can start with very simply. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, we have in the long run to rely on the, uh, the uh, natural flows of energy. Mm. Uh, there is clean uh, energy around, plenty of it. Uh, in fact, the natural flow of energy is quite dominant. It exceeds still commercial energy by more than 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a, there is a plenty a very rich of it. Yes. Flow. So if we summarize here, we have the requirement for open flows. We have the requirement of energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, can you formulate it in some other way, Niels? Yeah, we mm -hmm. can say that uh, we have to create new resources from waste. Out of the waste, yes. And mm -hmm. that is. Not always so easy. Mm. And how is it actually being done? Mm. Yes, from the former picture you see here, we have to use the ecosystem and it is the sun that provides the driving force to create new mm. raw materials, new energy sources from the waste. Mm. So the, re the energy to do this is provided by the sun? That's right. The Earth receives high temperature radiation from the Sun and exports low temperature radiation to the cold outer space. It is an open system in terms of energy, but closed in terms of matter. On Earth, this flow of energy is doing work while losing its order. 
Water is vaporized from oceans and purified, and winds drive clouds over land where rain falls. Life appeared in the sea close to four billion years ago. With the aid of sunlight, green cells of plants concentrate carbon dioxide and combine it with water to carbohydrates, building blocks for plants and animals. Fossil fuels are formed while oxygen accumulates in the sky. The industrial society uses the accumulated resources and transforms them to gaseous waste and to solid and liquid waste. So now, Tage, if we use the ordering capacity of the sun for creating new resources, how can that be formulated more efficiently in terms of energy? Yes, what we really need and want from an exergy source is, mm -hmm. um, in principle, what we would call negative entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit theoretical, I agree, mm -hmm. but it represents uh, order organization, structure or contrast in mm. some way. It's a quality uh, of energy that we find in the energy source, mm. uh, which is contrary to the background energy, uh, which is plenty around in the ecosystem, which mm. is useless. Mm. Now, we have ha had over some 20 or even 30 years a new concept, which is called exergy which measures these two things uh, mm -hmm. of an energy source, the quantity and the quality simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful concept for ecological uh, applications mm -hmm. since uh, it is defined also from a sort of a tension between the order and structure that you find in the energy source mm -hmm and the background that you've got in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the exergy is the concept we should keep in mind and, mm -hmm. and using and taking care of mm -hmm. to uh, create a sustainable society. Yes. Now, of course, it's interesting to see what has happened during the evolution of life on Earth is that this exergy uh, content in the sunlight has been uh, used for creating life itself and we have a short wonderful video here you see that yes the evolution of earth creates life and this has taken of course a number of billion years to get this uh, uh, the oxygen in the sky and the fossil fuels in in the under the water. Mm -hmm. What the industrial society makes is to reverse. So uh, we're actually uh, doing the evolution backwards today. Yeah, I, I just mm -hmm. checked with a meteorologist yes, and he sir. said that we are back some hundred millions of years uh, in terms of carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. That seems rather serious. So we are back hundred million years. It's long before man existed. It's about the time man has existed in fact hundred million. Or 100,000 years, 100 millions, you say. That's what he said. That's mm, quite or 10 serious. millions. Mm. It was. Mm. Now, so we need some thinking about this how to create resources out of waste to come out of this dilemma. And um, I'm sure we could look at nature to learn something about that. When you light a fire in the stove, a pleasant warmth can spread in the house. But on the outside, the smoke rises against the sky while ashes accumulate in the stove. Now we want to make resources out of waste. How do we make wood logs from the smoke coming out of the chimney and from the ashes? Can you imagine the equipment and process needed for that? Smoke is mainly carbon dioxide and water vapor and ashes are a mixture of lime and some other oxides. Can these substances be transferred to wood with the aid of heat and some pressure, maybe? So, you see, this was something to think about. Nature is very clever in doing this. What kind of man-made machine would be necessary to do that? Uh, you can think about that. Uh, in the meantime, we'll sum up this uh, discussion. What are the conditions for sustainability? First of all, we need circular flows of matter, we need renewable energy sources, and we need the efficient technology. 
and with that we will be able to create resources out of waste. Now we are going to see what a sustainable society would look like in the future. And the first important um, region we look into now is energy and industry. And of course it's possible to, to uh, manage energy in a way that is sustainable. I think we have a few comments on that. The, Nils, you put together some examples. Yes, we have some examples of how it's implemented at present. Now, here you see wind energy uh, applied on a farm. And uh, especially in Denmark, uh, the wind energy has spread and is uh, used uh, to quite an extent. The bioenergy uh, produced on the fields is also important. And here we see uh, a certain kind of grass which can be used. Uh, we move quickly here over to the forest, producing uh, bioenergy very important in countries like Sweden and Finland, big forests, of course. And here we see the uh, solar cells, which can be used uh, very uh, Directly on remote using solar places. energy. Yes, mm -hmm. on remote places. Here mm -hmm. is Europe's uh, largest uh, solar heater plant in Falkenberg. Uh, and here we see solar panels on the roof of a, an ordinary uh, apartment, apartment house, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th those are examples on how it can be done today. I guess another important aspect of this would be uh, a saving. Target. Now you mentioned that there are enormous amounts of, of renewable energy, but uh, still perhaps saving would be a good idea. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my new concept, which mm -hmm. is exergy, is very useful for judging about the possibilities of uh, energy conservation as mm -hmm. we call it. Mm. Uh, and uh, there are two aspects of this. Mm. Uh, quantity one, you should use less, you should tighten the leaks and so forth. Mm. But there is a quality aspect also. Uh, mm. Even temperature is uh, involving a cost of resources. Mm. Mm. And uh, the high quality energy must be used only for special purposes, I should mm. say. Mm. Electricity is perfect for running machines, for transportation even. Mm. It should not be used for heating. It's a low quality demand of mm. energy and it's really wasteful uh, mm. using uh, what you are, we You are wasting exergy in this case. Yes, mm. you waste the quality. Mm. What about the situation in Eastern Europe, in, uh, in Russia and Lithuania? Uh, Dinas, what would you say? Mm. Yes, unfortunately, we have only negative examples mm. <laughs> how to, to use, to save energy. Mm. But I think uh, the economical solution will be in not far future in Eastern mm. European countries and mm. only economical sanctions mm. must be de developed. Mm. So you are waiting for a price mechanism so to be efficient here. Yes. Energy prices should rise and then energy saving should increase. Yes, it's mm -hmm. true. Now, there are several technical devices to use exergy and you have one, Torge. You are thinking mm -hmm. of the heat pump, mm -hmm. uh, which is a device that I uh, adore in mm -hmm. many ways yeah. as a means of, of a better energy mm -hmm. efficiency. Mm -hmm. We've got a video to demonstrate a, a very big, in fact two big heat pumps. In Umeå, where you come yes, from. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Well, you're welcome to join us at the heat plant in Umeå, which provides domestic heating to the major part of this city. Uh, and no less than 25% of the primary heat is provided in this uh, plant involving two heat pumps. Of course, there is a traditional um, heat plant also where fuels are burned, primarily biomass, oil and um, garbage along with some electricity. But this special plant provides 25% of the whole when it is running at uh, maximum capacity. Uh, it's Bengt Johnson who runs this uh, uh, division 
and uh, we can tell you about the performance here very quickly that uh, right now there are 1100 cubic meters per hour of water coming in from uh, the water purification plant. Previously, we have been able to use here also water, sort of lukewarm water from a paper mill in the vicinity. And uh, the water is cooled presently from about 13 degrees centigrade to 2 degrees centigrade. The heat power output right now is um, 20 megawatts. And we will see what the electric input of power is on the two heat pumps. What do you say, Bengt? Uh, it is uh, five megawatt. The two together make five megawatts of power for running the heat pump. That means that the uh, coefficient of performance for the heat pump is actually very close to four. It's a little bit less, I should say. The maximum coefficient of performance that is normally reached in the fall, in the autumn, is 4.2. We are now in the hall where the heat pumps are. They are both running and it's terribly noisy in here. You can see the electric engine running the compressor here. The big cylinder here is the condenser. And that other cylinder is the vaporizer. I hope this will give you some impression of what it looks like and what it works like in a plant like this. So uh, another aspect of industrial society that is, will be important also in a sustainable society are the metals. What about metal flows in a sustainable society, Niels? How do you imagine that could uh, be organized? We'll have to form cyclic flows and we have to have the interest on the use of the, on the metals more mm. than on the supply side. Uh, we have to find new systems, new designs of products so that they are used in cyclic systems. Mm -hmm. And the proof of that we have succeeded is that the mines are closed. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have today any uh, steel uh, mills that are using scrap iron? Yes, uh, in fact there are some positive examples. Uh, uh, for instance in the United States of America the uh, mini mills, the efficient scrap based uh, mini mills are running very well. They are mm. going much better economically than the big integrated mm. ones. And reuse of copper I think is also important for example. Yes and of course mm. all these toxic uh, metals like lead we have looked on it's very important to rule out those uses where it is spread in the environment. Mm. Like petrol in, like lead in petrol. Yeah, and that so should be ruled mm. out mm. right away. Mm. Now, if we go on from industry and energy to the ecosystems, the agriculture, um, it's of course extremely important that they are working in a good way in a sustainable world. And most important is, of course, the uh, flow of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And it's needed to have an agriculture without the use of artificial fertilizers. We see that it is uh, possible. We have uh, a group of farmers, farmers which are uh, practicing uh, ecological uh, farming methods. Mm -hmm. And on these farms, you must have this balance between uh, crop production and uh, animal production in, uh, with this intensity which you have as average in the Swedish agriculture. Mm -hmm. And there you can have the situation that a bigger part of the nutrients which are uh, uh, taken up of the plants are bringing to back to the soils through the animal production and through the stored manure to back to the soil. Mm -hmm. The biological fixation compensates for the losses on the nitrogen side. What mm -hmm. about on the phosphorus side? Well, you see on phosphorus, so it is when the plants 
take up about 20 kg phosphor per hectare a year. It is only 5 kg per hectare which are going out in sold products mm -hmm. and 15 in going back. But this 5 kg phosphor per hectare, it is so much which is possible to bring from the soil through the weathering processes. So these farms don't need to buy artificial fertilizers to the farm. Mm. How many farmers do this in Sweden now? In Sweden it is today uh, 2,000 farmers. It is uh, about 2% of the farmers in Sweden. Using uh, alternative farming or ecological farming? Oh yes. Mm. So here we are on the field plot right outside the University of Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala. And uh, Arthur, what uh, are you doing in these places? Here we are studying uh, four different types of uh, yes, uh, uh, rotations. Mm -hmm. um, and three of them is, uh, are ecological. And here you have the ecological agriculture systems with uh, a uh, five years crop rotation. Mm. And in this crop rotation, it's two years with uh, a lay, lay with the grass and clover together. To uh, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. That's right. And the three other years you have? A winter wheat, and then you have uh, oats together with peas, and, and then... last you have barley with undersound of clover and grass for the uh -huh. new crop rotation period. But this is very old knowledge, this crop rotation. How come you have large harvests? That's right. It's an uh, old uh, farming system together with the knowledge we have about all the technical things in agriculture. So you can become a uh, high yield with a difference only about 20% between conventional and ecological agriculture systems. Mm -hmm. So these pictures are from a uh, couple of days ago when I visited Harter at his working place at the uh, University of Agricultural Sciences in the midst of the spring uh, work uh, on the fields. Now Arthur, do you have some experience of the other countries of the Baltic region? Do they also try to develop ecological farming? Uh, oh yes. Um, uh, we see uh, on the other side uh, uh, the situation in, in Finland. It's going on with ecological agriculture. It's 0.3% uh, of the total area there today. And I've been two times in, in Estonia and I have seen examples there for the movement in, uh, with the ecological farming. Mm -hmm. What are the background for that? Do they try to avoid imported fertilizers, for example, or what are the reasons for doing this? Uh, the reason is that really the environmental uh, problems with uh, um, the very intensive uh, uh, animal production mm. with the losses of, of nutrients. But I think that is uh, a thing with uh, that it's uh, very expensive to buy artificial fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned these intense animal units. What kind of animal units have you seen? It's the very intensive form of, of animal. It is uh, the, you have uh, pigs. Mm -hmm. When you buy a, a great lot of fodder uh, to a farm, uh, four times more than you can produce on the own farm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you have a situation with uh, nutrient losses to the surroundings, about mm -hmm. 300 uh, kilogram nutrients per mm -hmm. hour. Mm -hmm. So there are extreme point sources of nutrients, nitrogen leakage and so on. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. so. We will show the contrast of this, the ecological farm, and we visited one such farmer, in fact. Staffan Arén is a farmer using alternative cultivation methods, that is, ecological agriculture. He started in 1985. Then only 0.2% of the farms in Sweden used ecological methods. Today it is 2%. In the long run, I believe, Staffan says, everybody will be forced to use ecological methods. We try to sell everything directly from the farm to consumers or retailers. 
This year we have an excess of crop, so we have more pigs than usual. But there is a demand for alternatively raised pigs, so that works fine. We do not use artificial fertilizers nor any biocides. This year we have more thistles, but uh, we will press them down next year, I'm sure. The system we use is much the same as during the 1950s, but the productivity is much higher. There are not as many people working in the farms as then. We use hydraulic machines and so on, just as in conventional farming. There is a balance between animal production and crop production, and we have both cows and pigs on this farm. So, um, this is what it looks like on these farms. That, do they pay themselves? I mean, does it pay? Is it good business, Arthur? The, uh, the production is cheaper mm. in the moment you have not to, to buy artificial fertilizers. Mm. So when your uh, production is 15% uh, lower, you can have the same economic as in conventional agriculture. Mm. But when you can sell the products on the market and become a higher price, you can have a better economy. I see. So it's actually a better business in some cases. It can be. Mm. That's right. Very good. Now another aspect of, uh, of these farms is of course uh, what's happening with the products. And one of the important products is the milk. And Niels, I know you had uh, contact with a one farmer who is producing, he's, uh, he's using his own dairy. Yes. Hmm? We'll have a look at this uh, small on-the-farm dairy now. You see here how uh, the milk comes into the separator and the cream is going to one side and uh, the consumption milk is uh, going to be pasteurized for later delivery. And here it's uh, taken up in buckets um, for and, uh, also sour milk is made from the milk which uh, was left over from the day before. So there are a number of products and uh, here the farmer himself, Mr. Johansson, is delivering directly to the customers in the neighboring town of Kungsör. He even brings the milk right into the fridge so it's very practical for the, for the customers and uh, no packaging is needed. Uh, so it, has, it has been a lot of work, he admits, but, uh, but it is uh, very good for the environment. So it's the same as uh, with the uh, farmer we just saw it. He has the, uh, the customers very close to himself. Mm. Yes, the customer is close. So, so this is very much small scale we have seen so far. Is this uh, typical for sustainable society to do things in the small scale? Yes, I think mm. it is necessary, mm. uh, the small scale, um, because uh, we have the, the energy uh, decentralized. Mm. The reasons for the small scale, the small is beautiful as the slogan was a few years ago. Uh, the reasons for being small are then if we sum up. Um, Decentralized resources, and then you have. Um, sorry, I, mm. I, I think I missed there. <laughs> the decentralized resources, mm. and uh, what about the the transport? And the transport, the of course, is very important that you can avoid, as we saw here. Mm. Yes, and then we also have the uh, social situation. Yes. The mm. possibilities to have a control over the situation also mm. towards uh, which is, is democracy and so yes. on. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's uh, go on to the next section we are going to talk about is that is living and lifestyle. How do we live in a sustainable society? How do we arrange our own lives? And the first examples we are we have is on the countryside. Yes. Yes. Where do these pictures come from? This is a picture from one of the eco municipalities in uh, Sweden and there are now 55 eco municipalities mm. all over the Nordic countries. One thing they, uh, they do? do there is of course uh, ecological 
growing of uh, vegetables. And uh, then new techniques have to be developed to avoid fertilizers and biocides. Mm -hmm. But that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Arthur may have comments on mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but it's uh, developing quite well and it's mm -hmm. selling. The market is growing. Interesting. Now, if we go to the people in the cities, are they also able to arrange their lives in an ecologically sound way? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, we have also an example of how to arrange ecological living in the cities. Mm -hmm. And here you see some houses this, in Göteborg, yeah. That's right. Western Sweden. This is a quite typical apartment house in uh, Göteborg and it was rebuilt in 1986. It was provided with solar panels on the roof, as you see here, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the heated air from the solar panels was used to preheat the air surrounding the house. So uh, in the fall and in the spring, the energy consumption is much reduced. In the summer, though, the heat is used to preheat the tap water not only for this house, but for four other similar houses. Mm -hmm. So this pays off. It's a good economy also. Yes, it's good economy. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it takes a few years, but uh, it's 40% less energy. And here's a very interesting thing. Um, the house was supplied with a greenhouse and uh, for growing vegetables for all the inhabitants. And one important aspect of this was a social aspect. Mm. Uh, people started to meet. Mm. And they used their own uh, uh, household waste here yes. for composting? Yes, they are closing at least part of this nutrient flow by composting and producing their own uh, mm. vegetables, mm. like tomatoes and cucumbers. Of course, it's very interesting, as you say, this is a new way of life, it's a new lifestyle, which has benefits in terms of social context and so on. Is this something you would like to underline as the uh, key issue for creating a sustainable world? Yes, I think mm. uh, it is uh, the lifestyle and the connected ideas that mm. can change, really, the world. Mm. Tage, what would you say are the key issues for a sustainable world, if you sum up your points here? Yes, mm. of course, in a way, we would depend on fairly big systems. Mm. We talked mm. about water last time in this uh, series of programs. Mm. I think on the community level we are bound to have uh, systems that are mm. reasonably big. Mm. But uh, of course the, uh, the uh, decentralized society has a lot uh, mm. of advantages from the ecological point of view. The solar power, the wind mm. power, the biomass is already distributed mm. uh, and there is no cost for distribution, transportation and so forth. Mm. That, that, that's a basic mm. principle. Mm. And Arthur, you would uh, also talk about sustainable world in your context. Mm. Yes, mm. and uh, you must have, th have this uh, connection between agriculture and where the people are living. Mm. Mm. So, thank you very much for these comments. Now it's time for some more music.
Thank you very much, Rumbus uh, Now we have enlarged the panel to the twice the size of before, and we have done that with two of our students from the Uppsala course, the Sylvia Carlson and Thomas Beiström. And then we have three of the coordinators from previous session. It's from this side. It is uh, Bengt Hultman, the coordinator of session number nine on waste manage water management, and then Janne Holmbom from uh, Obo Academy, which was coordinating one of the coordinators of session number five on industrial toxicants and pollutants. And finally, or firstly, if you want to, Kurt Forsberg, who was the coordinator of session number three of eutrophication of the Baltic Sea. And with all these now 10 people, we are going to discuss in more general terms how we want to create our future in the Baltic region. A sort of sum up from all these 10 sessions. Let's start with the students. Sylvia, what would you say are the most important in looking at the future? Well, I would say that the most important thing is to have a positive outlook. Mm -hmm. In the Chinese language, there's a, uh, the word for pro the sign for problem has mm -hmm. two parts. And the one is crisis and the other is possibility. And I think this is the starting point, that we, will, uh, we have the possibility to show that human beings are so creative that we can find the solutions to the problems we have caused. Thank you. Thomas, what would you say? Uh, what I see today is a conflict of long-term social and uh, economic development versus mm -hmm. uh, a short-term economic and uh, social development. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to face it. The, the world is run by economists and I think Many of those problems that we have been discussed could be solved in economical terms. And I'm specifically thinking about the exploitation of resources and the release of pollutants, which I think could be solved by ways of uh, economic costs for those who are releasing pollutants, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to see resources as a company would see it's its resources. You don't sell them out at once. You, you, you have to let them work for a long time. So I mean, it would not be a good policy for a company to just sell everything and then gain a lot of money in the short time. On the other hand, you could uh, sell it out slowly or, or make it produce all the time. So, would, think, so it's a change of attitude, I think. So you would say the company, the Baltic region, or the company, the globe, if you want to, should well, not get rid of its resources in a few years. It's yeah. the same, isn't it? Yeah. It's, um, what is good for the global region or the mm. local region, it's mm. probably the same solution for mm. it. Well, we have talked a lot about that already, I think. Yeah. Now let's ask uh, Bengt, what do you see, uh, since you are one of the people who are expert, expert in managing the waste we have been discussing today, what role do you think waste water management and uh, the uh, treatment plants will play in the long-term future? I think they will play an important role also in the future. But we must consider that we, we must change a little on these systems because mm. the original rule was just transportation of clean water to society and transport of wastewater from society. And now we must also do this in an environmentally safe way. And we have a lot of things that should be considered. We must think of clean technology, and that is sometimes also economically justified, nearly always, I would say. We must think of separation, both of water streams and of wastes. Mm -hmm. We must think of preventive maintenance, because that's very important that we can have these systems that we do not repair too much. We must also think of more effective treatment methods, and that can also be solved because we have technology for that. And maybe the most difficult part that is on recycling, because that has not been solved yet. We must recycle sludge, have a good quality. We probably must recycle wastewater because it's a water crisis in the world, mm -hmm. but we have solved to some extent heat recovery. As mentioned, these heating pumps are used in many ways, and uh, <coughs> for instance, also the largest treatment plants in Stockholm use heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Nils? Would you agree with Bengt here? No, I think we need more of a systems change, uh, and I think we we should. Uh, 
look more into the source separation even of wastewater as mm -hmm. we saw in the session nine where you had an example of this ur new ur urine separating mm -hmm. system. I think that uh, offers uh, development possibilities even for the mm -hmm. towns. Mm -hmm. Now, in Eastern Europe, uh, the wastewater plants are not being constructed for huge amounts of money. Is, is this a good thing to do, or should you use the money differently? What do you say, Linas or Nikolai, who wants to answer? Comment. I mean, we must uh, first uh, to change our mental. We must uh, uh, reconstruct our economy mm -hmm. and decentralize our economy. For deciding of very complicated situation in our country. Mm -hmm. So you see, you have a very centralized structure, yes. and you want to be more. Uh, you you want to have more control of your own situation on the local level. You mean? Yes, we have mm -hmm. uh, some control, mm -hmm. not very strong, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So you agree that small is beautiful. Yeah. It's important for democracy and so on. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the wastewater treatment plants is important also in eutrophication. Kurt, now you, you are an expert in this also. What do, you, what, what do you think is the solution to this? To wastewater treatment? Yes. Yeah, this is a very difficult problem for mm. the urban areas. Mm. We have been discussing it before and the problem has been excellently uh, demonstrated by Niels today uh, using uh, this system filling up balance between inflow and outflow and accumulation. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens in, in our modern society today. So uh, during a um, very, very short period of time, mm -hmm. we are uh, coming up to a point uh, when the leakage flux from stored uh, amounts probably will increase. And uh, if we are unhappy, we are, uh, in many countries, uh, spending money on changing point sources to uh, non-point sources. Mm -hmm. and this is not the good water protection work, I think. Mm -hmm. so but you I, I have some other ideas, more general. I, uh -huh. And what are these ideas? Yeah, this is concerning the whole concept. It has mm -hmm. been touched today. Uh, and uh, the lifestyle is, I think, the key words we had to, mm -hmm. to focus our interest on because we are the problem, at least in the modern Western uh, countries. And uh, as we at the same time is a model for many other countries concerning lifestyle, mm -hmm. it's a need to start to, to change immediately, I will say, and try to learn how to do it because it's very, very difficult. We are used to live very comfortable and we don't like to miss it. Mm -hmm. But it's a question of reducing use of energy and use of natural resources. I don't think technology can help us in the long run because technology mm -hmm. also most often need energy. And mm -hmm. energy, as far as we know today, most often create pollution. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. more, more interest and more effort and more money on how to educate ourselves, start in the Western mm -hmm. countries and try to um, develop new models. John, uh, you are, have more connections with industry than anybody else here, I think. What's your comment to this? Yes, I mm. agree that it's desirable that we change our lifestyle, but that's not so sure it will come. So I think there is a good hope in the clean technology concept, at least for solving some of the problems, because mm. there are huge possibilities still. And, um, but this clean technology will not come by itself. We need to have pressure from society. Mm. And, um, you know, the scientists and engineers developing these things, they are lazy, like a little bit like people in common. And, mm. and they have shown that w when there are pressures, mm -hmm. things will happen. We can mm. take as an example the chlorine free bleaching, which mm. was told two years ago to be completely impossible. And there it is today. Mm. Because of the pressure from the common people. So From the consumers. And mm -hmm. I think that's an important group. I mean, mm -hmm. we as consumers can change the, the industry. We have the power over mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. Is that a different economic uh, mechanism than the one you were talking about, uh, Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> well, no, no well, yeah, it's different, of course. Mm -hmm. um, this is a power from the people, I suppose, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. force the companies to change. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were talking a little bit about f f forces, I guess, from the government itself. 
at least you were touching it. Important mm -hmm. too, yeah. yes. And uh, one way that the economics are talking about it or thinking about today is mm -hmm. that if, if you use resources that could not be recycled or reused, mm -hmm. then anyway it gains for the GNP. Mm -hmm. Now, th that's the weird thing that it, if, if you take out all the iron or all the fishing or use of fishing too hard, it gains the GNP, but, you're, but at the same time you're losing your inventories, speaking in economic terms. So this means <laughs> that the uh, national, the grand national product right. of, the, of the country is, yes. the economy of the country is on the surface um, becoming better, mm -hmm. but I mean in real terms it's actually We, we are losing, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. like selling out all your stocks, I suppose. Mm -hmm. so, I know that that's something that the government is working with and I think that's something that will come up in the future. And, and that I think is going to be one of the most important contribution mm -hmm. for a sustainable econo economic system. Mm -hmm. Now Sylvia, when we talk about the new lifestyle, what uh, would you say? We talked about challenges. Is this a challenge? <coughs> yes, of course it is a challenge, but I mean humans all, we are sort of, we like our habits. And it might seem as a sacrifice in the beginning to give up old bad habits, but we have to do it. And I can't see that it is a human right to be allowed to waste energy or waste materials. It, it, for centuries, I mean, we have so few generations have had this so-called privilege to, to waste things. Mm -hmm. But it can't last for long and we have to see that. and. Then it will only be a sacrifice in the beginning. Mm. Now, Nils, you know many of these people living in eco villages and in ecological housing and so on. What are their attitudes? Did they lose something or did they gain something? They gained. Uh, I think that is uh, very generally so mm. that people, to start with, think that this will be uh, something in ashes and uh, very terrible. But uh, actually, it is quite interesting and it can be quite like a sport to use as little resources as possible. And there are social and uh, m many positive factors that uh, you, especially when you come together, a few mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and try to change. And I know you are living in the midst of the city with uh, composting and hens and everything, and that's working, eh? Uh, it's working. <laughs> it's uh, wonderful because mm. we are together on it, so mm. somebody will feed the hens when I'm away. On the uh, university. Yes. Yes. Now, Linas, what uh, would your comment be on the lifestyles? What's discussion in Lithuania? Do they also think in these terms? Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> I was talking, we have a only negative examples <laughs> uh -huh. about uh, lifestyle, but uh, the existing I lifestyle. But what about the discussion for the future? What do people future? want? Yes, I think this communication, mm. the communications we had all through the Baltic University, will mm. be very, very nice for our future, mm. to our students, to to know how to live and See. also for our teachers. So we for. hope that this discussion here will uh, help such discussion get going in many other places. I this, think so. Mm, so let's keep the discussion going between the various uh, countries here also. Now Nils, do you want to say something? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would like to say something about energy because mm -hmm. uh, which connects mm -hmm. to what... Uh, I think we need a new view on energy that is very important. Energy has been looked upon as being the savior for, for the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, when new values develop, when we see the world better, uh, we'll understand that energy is something that we should use as little of as possible. And that mm -hmm. is uh, the beginning mm -hmm. of a new uh, development, a post-industrial mm -hmm. society, if you want. I see. So energy is one important thing then lifestyle is another important thing and so far there are a lot of promises in this but there also might be some difficulties. 
Well, thank you very much. I think our time is over for this discussion, but let's see this as a start and it will go on in many places. As Dina said, it will go on in Lithuania, on the eastern rim of the Baltic, and it has already started here today. Thank you very much. Now, it's time to sum up what we have been doing over, over this year in the Baltic University. And first and most importantly, we have during this year built up a network with some today 87 universities as well as in other couple of institutions. On the map you can see where they are. In fact we have today a representative from the northernmost university, Lulio, with Nils, from the easternmost with uh, Nikolai Filatov from Pedrozavodsk. And we will also have a contribution from the most southern university, the Jaglonian University in uh, Krakow, who sent us a message and we will uh, let them uh, give the greetings also to you. The main marketplace in Krakow is considered one of the most magnificent town planning projects in the world. Centuries ago, inhabitants of Krakow gathered in the main marketplace to attend various state important ceremonies. One of the most interesting monuments is the Collegium Maius, the former building of the Jagiellonian University, one of the oldest universities in Europe, founded in 1364. The importance and fame of the Jagiellonian University went beyond the Polish borders. During the period when Nicolaus Copernicus was one of its students, it was attended by young people from almost all of Europe. We are on the roof of the building of the Institute of Geography, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. We are geographers from this institute. My name is Joanna Pociask karteczka My name is Mirek Żelazny. Uh, there is a suitable place for looking at the view of Krakow. There is the Wawel Castle, the place and residence of Polish kings when Krakow was the capital of Poland. Many geographers from our institute are interested in research connected with the quality of Krakow environment. We have come here to present you how the water flowing to the city is polluted. This instrument shows us the water conductivity in micro -simenses. It indicates the total mineralization of the water. The fresh water has 405 micro -simenses. The water from the Vistula River has a few times more, more than one and a half thousands, about 18 hundredths micro -simenses. The fresh water. And I'm catching the water from the Vistula River. There is a joke about the Vistula River water in Krakow. In spite of this situation, fish have been living in this water and people catch them. If people want to fry these carps from the Vistula, they don't have put any spices because these carps are already spiced with pollutants, of course. So this video from Jagiellonian University is the latest in a long series of videos that we have received from all of you. There are in total about 200. This one was with just saw three minutes out of it, but in total it's almost 15 minutes. They have all been collected in this catalog, a video catalog for the Baltic University, just as you made them. And we will distribute this catalog to all of you and you will be able to order copies of all these videos. Many of them are much more interesting 
and much longer than we were able to show in these broadcastings. It's not always easy to make a video, in fact, and uh, there are, I'm sure that several mishaps have happened during, the, dur during all this recording work, but we have not, of course, seen much of it in the broadcasting. We have a few of them on tapes which we were involved with ourselves. And the first one is when we visited the Department of Zoophysiology in Uppsala. Do you remember the researcher who was going to show the gills of a fish? It's not always easy to hold the fish, in fact. This one just disappeared. So there is also several other. This is a very rainy day. Just south of Uppsala. Uh, we have Lars Bejström, who is a, a professor of, um, of a professor if not <laughs> docent. Of water management. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they have the West Swedish University of Agriculture. No, the uh, Swedish mm. University of Agricultural Sciences. Mm. 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 So, it was not that easy yeah, to see. Now, this is another one, it's the most theoretical, I think, of all who have appeared in the, on the screen. It's Lars Fellin in Göteborg who wanted to explain how the biochemistry of this toxification. Look out now. Hop. There it disappeared. The, the chalk just broke. If you didn't catch it, you can look now. It's a very forceful person. He broke the chalk. But <laughs> so that's all the, all the problems with video productions. We also had quite some work to do to be able to produce 10 booklets. And with me here I have Benny Kullinger, who has been responsible for the production of the booklets. Now, Benny, how is the situation now? We haven't yet seen number 10 and 8. Well, I have seen them because I just have them with me here, just ready. Mm. So now the, the booklets are complete, 10 in all. Mm. And uh, we will start to send them as soon as possible, I guess. Yes. Mm. Um, now, what would you say on these 10 booklets? What's your general comment on them? Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be able to, to, to produce them because I've met a lot of new ideas and, and new facts. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, to my knowledge, there are no complete uh, um, description about the Baltic region as it is in these ones. I think mm -hmm. they are quite unique. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're going to be available also in the future. Yes. And they are also going to be available next year when the course continues. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your work. And uh, we will send the two missing booklets as soon as we can to you. And another aspect of the Baltic University is, of course, the students. And uh, we have about 3,500 students registered, as we said before. And a few of them started to make a student network. With me here I have Ann-Kathrin Hallin and Christina Dahlberg from the Stockholm course. And um, Ann-Kathrin, how is the uh, plans on the network coming up? Well, um, we want to start a network um, for those of us who want to continue this discussion about the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are planning to make it in two parts. Mm -hmm. And the first part will be a newsletter and um, it will contain contributions from those who are in the network and letters and articles and um, to make a debate or to discuss and um, the second part Christina can tell about. Mm -hmm. The second part will be to make a register, a, a network register with our names and addresses and here we also want to put down what we are studying or working with and special topics of interests and we think that this can be used for useful contacts mm -hmm. in our future studies, projects, works, etc. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. I was mm -hmm. just want to say something yeah, more. Yeah. And uh, we will uh, distribute this um, newsletter as mm. soon as possible, hopefully before the summer. And um, at first we will send it to the university where the Baltic uh, University Administration is. Mm -hmm. and, um, but later on, maybe we can make it personal. Mm. We don't know yet. So the students who want to uh, come in for this network, they should send their addresses and so on to yeah. Stockholm University Group. Yes, the, uh, and where I think we have a sign with the address with the address mm. to the um, Stockholm Center of Marine Research mm. coming up. Yeah, um, and so it's if you write Baltic Network, 
Stockholm Centre for Marine Research, Stockholm University, 10691 Stockholm. That's so the then you will have a newsletter in a short while. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I hope you send in some contributions yeah. because it will. Uh, you want to have will... something to write in the newsletter yeah, also. But it mm -hmm. will contain information about the ID mm -hmm. of the network then. Too. The Baltic University is a network in itself, of course, and here we have the directory. Use that if you want to have a contact with a, uh, students or teachers at other universities. For example, when you travel. Uh, we know that the student group from Poznan is traveling in Sweden this summer. They are welcome and they have contacted us. Also, the troubadour in St. Petersburg, Leonid Tichomirov, is going to travel. Please contact St. Petersburg University if you want to uh, invite him. We also know that Lund University is inviting a group of students from Kaunas and from Gdansk. So there is a lot of traveling coming up here. Use the directory for helping your planning here of travels. And then we also should mention that there is a great number of various projects that is being conducted in connection with our own project, the Baltic University. One such that we would like to mention is the Copernicus project, which also involves a number of universities in the Baltic region. Uh, they had a course in ecological economics at Stockholm University last September. Mm. And this um, University Copernicus course is arranged by the Rector's Conference of the Baltic Region. Now, in the Soviet Union, in my homeland, we... The course consisted of a mixture of lectures, seminars and working group sessions, with strong emphasis on peer-to-peer -peer interactions among the participants, which is needed when addressing the pressing problems of the ecologically, economically and culturally diverse Baltic Europe. But what is it then that makes ecological economics important and why do we need this research field? Um, one, one might begin by asking why is it that um, it's taken so long for us to come to this point of view? Uh, why hasn't uh, this been obvious in the past? And I think one of the main reasons for that is that in the past the relative size of the human economy relative to the, the natural environment uh, was, fairly, was relatively small. So the things we were doing in the economy were not having this tremendous impact that we're finally starting to, uh, to see. It's finally becoming, becoming obvious uh, how much impact we are having on the ecosystem. So it's no longer possible uh, for us uh, to treat those two parts of the system independently. We have to look at the economic system as a subsystem embedded within this ecological life support system if we're going to survive into the, into the future in a sustainable way. This is we, the young scientists from all Baltic countries and representing different disciplines since some of us are nature scientists, some of us are economists and all of us are a little bit committed to the integration of, of both. At the end so of the course we, week, we, a statement was formulated identififying urgent and important research problems for approaching sustainability in the Baltic Sea region. Examples of research problems formulated by the group were what is the best system of ecological and economic indicators for the drainage basin? How do we reallocate capital and resources from environmentally destructive to environmentally sustainable activities? An anonymous decision was also taken by the group to initiate a wider network for exchange of information and future collaboration between the countries within the Baltic Sea drainage basin. The International Conference on Ecological Economics and Sustainability to be held at Stockholm University in August 1992 will present a good opportunity for the participants of this course to meet again. Mm -hmm. So contact Stockholm University if you are interested in this course. Now we will uh, talk about the project we initiated ourselves and this is a course in Geographical Information System. Ulf Erlingsson who is with us is the initiator and one of the teachers. Yeah, that's right, Lars. Mm -hmm. the, this is the first step in the establishment of a Baltic University GIS network. The purpose is to enhance the possibilities for a sustainable development, especially in the East. Of course, uh, 
you don't only need data, you also need tool to analyze the data in order to predict mm -hmm. what the results will be of various actions. And the uh, geographical mm -hmm. information systems are an excellent tool for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, next year we are going to continue the Baltic University based on the existing booklets and the tapes of our broadcasting. And all universities are welcome to join and arrange their own courses. The Secretariat in Uppsala will provide the tapes and the uh, booklets necessary. Please write to us if you are interested to run the course next year. And with these words, our course this year has come to an end. We thank you all for contributing and participating. You created this as, as much as we did. In fact, we created it together. We wish you all a nice summer and we hope you have enjoyed to learn more about the environmental situation and also about each other. Now, we are going to try to create a, board, a better Baltic <laughs> University. <laughs> What's coming here? Well, goodbye. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs>